Um, today's topic is creating a homework playlist and I chose this theme because um, I think that homework is something we don't always talk about when we're talking about curriculum development. Um, and the idea of making a playlist is kind of cool because, um, you know, when you're putting together a playlist of songs, you want to have variety, you want to keep it interesting, you want to represent different moods, different aspects. And um, I think it's important to do that too when you're creating a homework playlist um, to keep things interesting for variety. So that's that's our topic for today. And I think before we even get started, the most important thing to do is ask yourself, what does my school expect us to get out of homework? Because every school will be very different. Um, my own background as a learner is I went to a, an elementary school where there was no homework at all, grades one through six. So that's one end of the spectrum. <laughs> and then, you know, eventually as a teacher, I was expected to give up working at an independent day school is pretty rigorous amount of homework. So how many assignments are you expected to give per week? For me, that's four per week, um, every week. And how many minutes should that homework take? How long of a homework assignment? For me, it depends on the level. For middle school, I'm expected to give 30 minutes of homework a night. And for my upper school students, I'm expected to give 45 minutes of homework per night. Now that's for the average student. And we have to remember that the same assignment will take one kid 10 minutes to do and another kid an hour to do. So that's averages. Um, between us, I will confess that I do not give that much as much homework um, as my school demands. I think my averages come in more like 20 minutes of homework for middle school and maybe 30 minutes on average for upper school. But of course, times when it's longer, times when it's shorter, these are averages. You have to find out how homework should be weighted. Does your school have a, a policy? Does your department have a policy about how you're supposed to weight homework? Me personally, in my school, I'm given basically freedom on how to do that. Uh, I think as a department, it's usually around 20%, maybe 20 to 30%, but it's for me, I can change it as I go. Um, I think it's important to consider whether grade books will be accessible to parents and how you're going to present your assignments and how you're going to post grades. For me personally, this is not an issue because my school does not have public grade books, but I know many people do. So um, find out the details. And I think it's important to compare how other people in your department, other language teachers are, are doing the homework and how they're posting homework assignments so that parents, as we know, parents all talk, <laughs> they compare, <laughs> they're all in each other's business. So if you can find out how your department is doing as a whole and sort of make sure you're in the same place, that's really important. And then consider whether all of your homework assignments will be graded. For me, definitely not. I try to do maybe one a week, um, but it's pretty much up to me. My students never know whether our homework will be graded or not. So I like to keep them guessing. Um, that may be different for you. So all these things are you have to know for your own own school. And I, I think there's an incredible amount of variety out there. Now, here's the next thing to think about. What are the benefits of homework? This is where it, the good stuff, right? This is where we can have a lot of opportunities to think about what we want to get out of the homework. For many of us, it gives us chance for extra repetition. I know for my students, I'm lucky my students, they are really good at studying what I tell them to study. So I can give them memorization stuff and drills to do at home and not have to do that in class. I know that's very different for some other um, teachers where you have to drill all your vocab in class because they won't learn it at home. So know your students and you can use homework for get, to get that extra repetition in, whether it's through, um, whether it's about vocabulary acquisition or rereading re a story. For me, this is a big one, bringing in creativity. I feel like I've seen my students, I teach fifth grade all the way up through high school and it seems like the older they get, the least, the less creative they get. 
And so <laughs> I try to keep it alive as long as possible. So I give a lot of creative assignments that tap into whether it's drawing, making videos, acting out um, scenes. Um, I'm really big into the creative stuff. Some kids love it, some kids hate it, but that's a big one for me. And then another big opportunity with homework is the opportunity to assess their reading of Latin aloud. Um, you can really use those homework recordings as an opportunity to get them extra practice. And also um, you can assess their props with reading and pronunciation. It builds, um, you know, their independent study practice. It teaches them to do homework, to complete a task, to um, to be independent learners. And also, I think for me, I try to give assignments that require a lot of problem solving. So I don't always tell the kids how you're going to do this. Make a video and submit it. Um, and it's up to them to figure out what program to use, how to record it. Um, and so they're going to be independent problem solvers on how to get that assignment done. It can build their organization skills. This is a big one, especially for middle schoolers, but for high schoolers too. They've got to learn how to meet their deadlines. And if you didn't, if you don't give them their homework, they won't have that opportunity to to, um, to to learn to complete those deadlines. And it's the accountability, it's that feedback. Um, we've all had students who are doing great and learning a lot of Latin, but whose grades tank because they actually don't do any homework. Um, and that's you know important for them to realize you do have to actually complete those, um, those expectations. Uh, it's a life skill basically. So I think there are probably many other benefits of homework as well. We There are also a lot of bad things about homework. We don't have a slide on that, but I think you have to be careful about homework, um, that there are dangers and maybe um, the, the, the others want to, you guys want to um, weigh in on the, the dangers of homework too. I've seen homework done really badly from a teacher's perspective and from a student's perspective. Um, kids who have too much homework, the wrong kind of homework, but also teachers um, having too much to grade and not being able to keep up with the grading. So it's uh, can be a slippery slope there. So be be careful. There are dangers of homework too. Well, I, I think you absolutely are right. When kids spend four or five hours a night doing homework and you're saying they could spend up to seven. I know. Um, that is pretty huge and if they're in any other kind of extracurricular, which we hope they are, then they can't do that. They can't do all that uh, physically, mentally. Um, so that I think that would be a really stiff amount of homework, mm -hmm. even on an average. So, so the, I'm sorry. So one of the things I think that needs to always be asked is why are you giving this assignment? Mm -hmm. you know, these are the benefits of homework. But I think often, you know, if you feel that pressure of I have to give homework or um, I'm just I'm just frustrated that they're not learning this, so I'm going to give them lots of practice. But that sounds good in theory, but why are you assigning a worksheet that has fill in the blanks? Or why are you assigning something that, you know, sounds interesting, but really isn't reinforcing what you want to reinforce? It's part of, I think, that um, task assessment that you need to do when you're doing your lesson planning. Is like for me, it was always about asking myself, does this really either, as you say, repeat or practice what we've done, or does it set us up for new learning? And and does it actually align? You know, um, sometimes teachers will take the hand the workbook when we had a workbook or now the, the handouts, and they'll say, Oh, good, I can just assign this one this night. And I think kids call can see quickly when something doesn't connect, you know. Or, as you said, if the teacher gives them something and then realizes that there's 36 blanks they have to check off on each kids because they've just threatened that they're going to grade it. Um, so let's move on. Mark, yep. do you have anything? Yeah. So, how are we Be careful. <laughs> this was my biggest mistake, or we all sort of woke up to the fact that homework has to be cheat proof, especially if it's going to be graded. Um, I when I first started teaching, I I can't believe it, but I assigned a lot of translations, like translate this story. 
and do these exercises from the book and over time woke up to the fact that that was um, really easy to cheat on because as we all know, stories translations are out there. So, um, you know, I think it's impossible to create a cheat proof, a completely cheat proof assignment, but you can make them very hard to cheat on. And uh, so one way that if I do ever have uh, one little hint, if I ever have them translate, a lot of time I'll have them record themselves tra translating out loud mm -hmm. because that's really hard to make it sound like it's real if it's not. So that's one little thing. Um, I think permission for all of us, not all homework assignments need to be graded. You can always check whether it's done or not if you want to, but you don't have to grade everything. I don't think our students get that much out of us grading and correcting their papers. The more you can have them correct their own papers, the better. And if you are grading it, you should be it should be easy to grade because you work hard already and you don't need to work harder by grading more papers. <laughs> and so um, make it easy to grade and spend more time on creativity and teaching and working with students one on one. Don't spend your whole life grading papers or your weekends because your weekends should not be for grading either. Just a little advertisement. We have a whole webinar on formative assessments, and many of them are ways to um, check for understanding without actually grading something. So that's just an aside, but I think it's good to know that the, you know there's ways to do it easily. Yes, and if you're, um, you know, I think where we all want to work in the direction of going is having our students assessing their own formative assessment so they have a ownership and they have a knowledge of this is where I want to work on. So, you know, that's one one area that I need to work on personally is putting the um, the burden of, you know, assessing themselves on the students so that they have a sense of what they each need to work on in terms of skills. I'm sorry, I need to stop you. Um, there are two people so far that don't have any sound. Um, I suggested that they get out and come back in. Somebody says, um, does this not support Chromebooks? Yes, Chromebooks. So does anything, anybody kind of give me any information to tell them? Well, yes, when I looked it up today, Chrome is one that's a problem. So if they can come in with some other um, browser, they may be able to hear it. Um, he said, uh, one of them said, I've been on another browser. It didn't work then either. Okay, well, there is some kind of a patch, but we just found out about it, so I can't tell them the patch today. They can okay, I, the uh, I'll tell them that. Yeah. Um, I was just going to comment one other thing about this homework must be virtually cheap proof. You know, I think that thing you're saying about self ownership, even before there was an internet, kids sat in the hall or in someone's kitchen copying mm -hmm. each other's homework. I'm sure I did it at some point, or maybe not. One mother probably would have killed me. But um, the thing that kept us from really truly cheating was that the teacher then did something with that information the next exactly. day in the class that if I didn't do it myself, I couldn't really speak to it, you know? Because it was no longer about look at the piece of paper and just read me the answer. Well, you did six or eight of these. Now, what do you think if you did this one, what would it be? Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that kind of if and then you don't do it as a gotcha, you do it to show them you need to know this information so you can move on. Exactly. Okay, so shall we go on? Okay, so let's go for our playlist then. So what are my oh, so knowing your goals, like this is important. And I I love the idea of taking time to sit down and thinking about what do you want this homework to accomplish each homework assignment specifically as you were saying jenny but also homework in general yeah. um what do i want the sweep of my homework to do over the next three you know uh weeks for instance and for me my own goals are i want variety that's always going to be important for me i want it to build student interest and hopefully even excitement. I wanted to employ creativity and I want to provide extra practice and memorization or learning time. And I, I think everybody's goals will be very different. Um, so take some time to really think about it and write down your ideas and let that be your guide. For me, I didn't do that as I started teaching and it had to evolve organically. 
Um, and it took many, many years for me to get to the point where I'm, you know, I think I've reached this um, point of variety and and I'm always changing and and re sort of tweaking my goals as well. So it's a really important exercise. So um, I've compiled some samples of student work and some different kinds of assignments that I've given and that I've come up with over the years. A lot of it just through trial and error and trying to do different things. So I, I'm going to share some with you guys today and I hope that um, it can be some inspiration. Maybe you can chime in with your ideas and questions um, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to benefit from sort of this ideas. Um, Donna, so let's hold on one second. Did you see that sure. from Andrea? Is it no? Something flew in on my screen, which is unusual. Um, Andrea says homework is a way to build in practice. This is especially useful to in short classes that meet regularly, and also building in daily practice during block schedule. And she says still no sound. I'm sorry, Andrea. Oh, that's too bad. <laughs> Uh, Scott Allen asks a question. You might want to address it now. Okay. He said, my school has a 10% max weight for homework. Those long. As a result, it's hard to incentivize, incentivize, no, I can't, incentivize, incentivize students to do it. Any suggestions? So that's an interesting one. I haven't heard. So 10% for homework. Um, you know, that's where those um, in-class, the in-class, um, activities can probably be leveraged if you give homework assignments um, that have constitute continuity with what you're going to do the next day in class does your i wonder if the, the school has a limit on how you can grade in class assessments because you could link your in class assessments to the previous night's homework and count it as a quiz maybe or um, an in class assessment um, there's some flexibility there maybe so if you're keeping if your previous night homework relates to something you're going to do in class the next day that is graded that will incentivize the kids to do that homework um, i think and um, if it's fun that's another way you can do it um, if it's something that they're going to share uh, i have something in my playlist that you'll see in a few minutes which are these slideshows that the kids make with um, google slides or um, whatever and they um, share that and they really love it. So making it fun and shareable is another way, I think, to incentivize and entice students to do their homework. Make it something that they've never done before, they'll do it. So the other thing we would sometimes do is we would assign something and all I would say to the kids the next day, so did you see the video? And the kids who saw it, everybody would say yes, including the kids that didn't see it, I'm sure. But then I would say like this oblique question. So that was really fun. Or that was funny when he did what to call it, you know, and I didn't quite tell him what. So the yeah. kids who had it would nod and, and then the kids were like, wait, what was it? And I'd say, oh, oh, you probably forgot. And I wouldn't say any more and go on. So then when it was like, go watch something or go look at something, they were more likely to do it because they were you know, curious what everybody else knew that they didn't know. And they also saw that it didn't hurt. Sometimes with all the other kinds of homework, if they can get away with not doing some homework, they're going to, but if they find out, I just kind of watched this video for three minutes and I'm good, I can do that. Yeah, if you can make your homework the most fun homework in all of their classes, because it's different, That's cool, engaging, weird, funny, whatever, <laughs> then they will do it. Oops, I'm not going forward. There we are. Okay, so um, some of my artistic examples. Um, on the left hand side, you see a collage. Um, I just assigned a, um, a collage with images and Latin words from the story. This was, I think, the storm from um, Virgil, and um, which is uh, the end of the purple book selection. And um, so this student has created some stars, there's rain and a boat <laughs> and put the words on there basically to summarize this section of the Aeneid. Um, and, you know, I think they don't have to chance to 
make something like this in, in, in most classes. So it's fun for them, I think, in a way. And then you can, it's a great um, jumping off point in class the next day when you discuss that passage. What were the words you chose? What were the images you chose? What's the mood of the poem? And then you see, this is an activity from the uh, online teacher material for the sixth edition, which is making the comedic masks in unit one stage is it seven? Um, the in the in, te, in teatro section, and I just gave the students their uh, masters and had them make their mask, and then took all the kids' masks and created a bulletin board with it um, about the Roman comedic theater. So something that is just one night homework, um, not too complicated, but then you have this great creative experience. So. Um, those are two, we can go on to the next slide. Here is some uh, vocabulary on the left, a vocabulary drill where you just tell the kids, here's your list of words, here's your a vocabulary checklist, but draw a picture of each word to make a vocabulary poster. And um, here, you, and it doesn't matter how artistic you are because you, you can use stick figures, but then the really creative kids, of course, they, they go all out on it. Um, and those vocabulary words, that's a really good trick that kids really um, will remember what they've drawn. And then at a higher level on the right hand side, we have from stage 43 an illustration um, where I just assigned the kids to look at, it was one of the paragraphs of the, of the selection from Toria, choose a sentence and illustrate it. So. So can I say something about the vocabulary poster? One sure. of the things that was always interesting was watching when the kids would get to that word that most of us would say, the kid, most kids would say, I didn't get a drawing for it. And then someone would get a drawing mm -hmm. for it and we'd have this wonderful discussion and, you know, it would help everybody remember that word that had been a little harder to grasp because it wasn't really easy to illustrate. Yes. Yes. You can give um, some kind of extra credit or, you know, whatever your class gimmick is, you know. Yeah. Just today I was having the kids doing commands. I was practicing commands in class mm -hmm. and having them draw their commands. And it's a similar effect. It really, you know, it's just a really solid way for absorbing the meaning of what you're, um, what you're saying. Because you're basically thinking about that whole thing. It's not just a bunch of letters on a page. It's now... Well, how do I should draw a mother or how do I show somebody standing still? What makes it not just, you know, a statue, you know, those exactly. Yeah. And That's then sometimes, you know, sometimes the kids will just put in their sloppy version. But then sometimes like this example on the right hand side, you have a, a artist who is really conveying grief right here. Yeah. So yeah. it really um, gives those kids who they may not be the most verbal you know, best English student, but they can communicate in a different way. So I like giving that artistic mode of voice. And, and Stephanie, I assume that when you have them illustrate, you said a sentence, but it could be a paragraph or do two or three pictures to sort of summarize an entire story, perhaps. It can be very flexible. Yeah. You can set them very specific, uh, parameters do the beginning, the middle, and the end of this passage or this piece. Um, you can leave it very open depending on the level. It depends, you know, your students. My Many of my students, I can be very open. Choose something and you know, capture the essence. I could say something like that to them. Capture the essence of this and they'll do it. So it, you have to know your students, especially to how specific um, you have to be in your directions. And then also it's often helpful <clears throat> to provide examples. So does everybody get the same assignment? Like what if you have the kid who says, you're doing Illustratoria, I can't draw. Mm -hmm. Is there any chance of them doing an alternative to it or is it no? Nope? Sure. So usually I'll tell them that they can draw. If they don't want to draw, they can um, collage with images online. I often tell them, you know, you can also be creative and make a tracer um, using your iPad like a light table. Oh, nice. And then it's your drawing, but you had a little help. So those students who are not great artists, um, they can also do something uh, using a workaround or using very simple images. A right. tier, and that's another problem solving, isn't it? Mm -hmm. 
And that's very cool because you know I would think, oh, I better give them something totally different. You're saying, well, there's many ways to do this, you know. Exactly. Yeah. Work it, work around it, and figure out how to leverage your skills to yeah. solve this problem. I love it. Uh, here, here are a few more. Just completed the left hand one example um, about the baths with my um, seventh graders. Design your own bath. And luckily, I found graph paper at a thrift store, which was a huge find. So I had this good graph paper that I found, <laughs> and everybody got to create their own bath. And um, that was a great way. I, that was a new assignment for me, and I think the students did much better on the test because they had done that. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a couple that was done part start started in class and finished as a homework. And then for um, my my older students um, when they were reading about the arch of titus i had them choose a panel do some online research and find images of the arch of titus and do a drawing of a um, panel from the arch of titus Very nice. and uh, they were really they came out really nicely again when you have students of varying artistic ability if you break it down like just do a small panel they can choose something and then if they need to, they can do some tracing or whatever. So, um, and these assignments, you know, I don't always grade them <laughs> rigorously. I don't always grade them. Sometimes it's just like check plus for everyone because you did it. And then I have great student work to hang, hang up to in the classroom. And so to that point, it also occurs to me, there's times where it just doesn't matter if they do it together. Like if they're sitting somewhere and they're all drawing their best. Oh yeah. One kid looks over and says, oh, that's good. I didn't put that in mine. Mm -hmm. What do you care, right? <laughs> exactly. And it can be a group problem solving activity because one kid looks over and is like, oh, I mine was weird compared, like, why does mine look this way? Why does yours look that way? And exactly. then they can figure it out together, each creating their own final product, but still, um, collaborating a little bit and that's fine. Yeah, because I think that's something I really tried to get across to my kids. You know, um, there's a difference between cheating and collaborating and collaborating mm -hmm. there's many a time where that is what you're going to do for the rest of your adult life. Mm -hmm. You Absolutely. know, so learning how to collaborate and it's okay if someone knows something more than you do. Mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, are they, are you getting to know it too because they're helping you? Yeah. And I can't stress enough how important it is to teach the kids what the expectations are in terms of what is honestly completing this homework. What can I use on this homework assignment? Can I just use the book? Can I use the internet? Can I use, you know, my friend? Can I use my tutor? Um, I have to tell them because they don't, they weren't born knowing. So you have to show them all of those expectations or else you're setting them up for failure. It's so important for us to be up front, teach them up front how to like what's fair use basically. <clears throat> so uh, late, you know, in the more recent years, I've done a lot more, more and more every year with audio and visual stuff. Um, one of my students favorites is to use um, a presentation program to create a slideshow. We call them silly slideshows or serious slideshows for a piece of literature. For me, this is really big with the literature um, sections in unit four. And so we have a couple of examples here, a silly one of the incendium story from Pliny, which we it's, it's really cute. So we can run through a couple of <laughs> slides. So she's got to put the Latin in her own words and choose an image. <laughs> I love this one when I looked at it. It's so brilliant. And this student, oh, sorry, is, I'm uh, you know, she's a, an average student, but this assignment let her shine. <laughs> of course. Of course. <laughs> we'll have some firemen. I mean, we have to do this whole one. Maybe other ones will cut short. I, yes, this is so adorable. And what I do when I, the next day, this is talking about incentivizing the kids to do it. When the, when they come in the next day, I will read them dramatically and present <laughs> them <laughs> and uh, go through a bunch of different kids. 
slideshows and they'll see the variation of both their quote translation or interpretation and the pictures and they'll see the variations. So in 10 minutes we can go through like, you know, the content uh, brilliantly with their images and their rendering into English. So this is super fun to do. Totally. So that's the silly version. And then sometimes some, some pieces of literature do not lend themselves to silly. So my students, mem my, my Latin three 10th graders memorize the invocation. Um, the first um, 17, I think, lines of De Rerum Natura for our poetry contest. And then I had them also create a serious slideshow, um, which we can just see a few, sure. um, a few images, the same student actually, she just loves this. And uh, <laughs> here we go, Venus as Beyonce, pretty good image. And here they're putting the Latin with the images. And I actually in their presentation notes had them render it into English. So this assignment they did over step over a week really uh, in, in class and at home and created these. Um, so it's another way of showing comprehension basically. Um, if you can pick a good picture, <laughs> then you kind of you can show that you understand that. Um, the Latin to at least a certain extent, and then you can always add a layer of translation or telling the story in English too. So, um, that's a great one though. This picture here. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And of course, I assigned this, and I I never even expected them to use the gifs. And of course, the students are always one step ahead of us. And yeah. all of a sudden, the, they're coming up with these great moving images. And they had to show me how to actually add that to a slideshow. So again, the problem solving, right? So are these sisters or the same girl at different point in their career? It's the same girl, her Latin name and her actual name. <laughs> I so, thought that was very cool. Yeah. Yep. And she matured as the years went by. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <clears throat> so um, you can also, this is the biggest thing for me, record a story dramatically and at all levels, at every single um, stage of the Cambridge Latin course, you can have them record a story. And um, I do that often. I don't always grade them. Um, it's it's a tedious to listen to, but you can listen to the first couple of sentences. Um, but it gives them that practice. And um, you can hear a little bit. Daedalus in Terea, Cretan longum quae perosus exilium, tactusque loci natalis amore, clausus erat pelago, terras licet inquit, et un. I don't know when to stop, so why <laughs> just. Yeah. yeah. Is that fine? That's fine. Okay. That's probably one of the most straightforward ways to get into doing audio recordings is to just have them read a story and email you the recording. And they're pretty smart. They'll figure out how to do it. What's the best app for them to use or whether to use one of these screencasting devices, which you see on the right hand side. Pastor at Leo being read by a seventh grader. Olin Pastor in Silva Ambulabat Subito Pastor Leonem conspexit. Leo tamen pastorem non agitavit. Leo lacrimabat. Pastor post quam Leonem conspexit. Erat atonitus et rogavit. Cur lacrimas Leo. Cur me non agitas. Cur me non consumus. I felt like I had to let him go to a cadence. Yeah. <laughs> Stephanie, do you find that most of the students use the same uh, same program or app, if you will, to record? Or is are there so many different things out there now that it's just all over the place? A, a great variety. Um, I have I often recommend an app called um, Audio Memos. It's 
only 99 cents and it works quite well. Some students just do it on their phone and just send that. For longer files, it's hard to email. Uh, so we use Google Drive. You, you know, the student needs to put it in their Google Drive and then send me a link rather than an attachment. Um, so again, there's problem solving there, but no, the, the kids figure out what works. And if it doesn't work, I tell them it didn't work. Try it a different way. Um, so there is usually at the beginning of the year, especially with the seventh graders, there's a learning curve. <laughs> don't, don't expect it to work right um, from the beginning, but uh, you can train them and then they'll figure out what works best on their device. We have one to one, but it's all different devices. So we have iPads, Chromebooks, some kids use their phone. So it's it's best to say you figure it out. So do you start out like small and like go home and read me these these three lines or this part of a story? How do you do? How do you build to this? So we're always reading in class from the beginning of the year, as I'm sure you all are too. And then early in the year, it'll be read this. And often it's I would start with the model sentences. Um, this is something we practiced, something that they can go home and and read. Um, and then later in the year, um, I'll after they've learned about their online book, they can also listen to the story to practice sort of ahead of time. So I would start very early in the year, right in September um, with the first unit. I think, I think, I think I have them do the model sentences for stage one. Yes, thank you. Oh, we have a comment that says screencast o matic is free up to 15 minutes with a stamp. So that's another program that the students can use, I guess. I haven't met this one, but it sounds good. And then another person said, Amy says that using Google Classroom, she often posts assignments that students can upload their files to. So it's all in the cloud. So you can definitely set up um, using Google Classroom. I don't personally do it, but especially if you have big classes, I think this would be really helpful to um, have files that people can, your students can just upload to, and it's easy, definitely great. Um, here we have some audio and visual homework assignments where the students are assigned to tell a story using toys or stuffed animals. And um, this is a story from unit three. And I have three little examples. They're just adorable, which so I had to put in three versions of the same story. We won't play them all, but absolutely. And I got so excited to see them. <laughs> this one is adorable. Note the casting choices. Very, very smart. So Modestus is waiting for Riccio <laughs> to find the food in this do, 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 do. Well, ten Britons come in to the military camp. Led by her Cobrix. <laughs> Modestus doesn't know. Then Modestus thought he saw Stratio, but it was actually a Briton. But it was dark, so you couldn't see. Let's just pretend it's dark. Hey, Uge. Tandem wenerunt amiki. Heos amiki. Kukwendite. The Britons were scared. But where Cobrix told them, Nolite Timere, notus est mihi hic miles. Stultior est quam. You can, tell, you can stop there. So I've told the students that they have to tell the story and they have to use, I think, like 10 chunks of the Latin. So they have to choose parts of the Latin to incorporate into their telling. <clears throat> I love looking at the floors and the rugs that they filmed on, too. I know, they're bedroom floors. So Where Colbrix ordered his men to seize Modestus. One of the Britons approached him to tie him up, but his torch lit Modestus's tunic on fire. Ehu, he howled, <laughs> Ardio, may de warrant flamai. Having escaped from the hands of the Britons, he fled. As he broke through the opening, he met Stritio and his friends. He snatched the jar of wine from Alice and poured wine on his tunic. It's sonnet Modestus, shouted Stritio, astonished. Modestus took no notice of Stretchio's shout and pushed the jar into the opening. Subwini, yeah, we can stop there. <laughs> These are just so darn cute. I just love having the kids do them because each kid, their personality comes out and they have fun with it. So, just really fun to do. Great.
And her Latin was quite nice. Yeah. Sergio was searching for the dinner in France. Ten Britons, having been led by our coverts, were approaching the camp. <laughs> These are the Britanni. <laughs> to attack the camp. The Britons, after they avoided the guards, entered the camp. <laughs> holding torches in their hands in order to burn down the barns. They quickly arrived at the barns because they had previously learned where they were placed. I get slow there. Again, your problem solving thing of, you know, what do you have much of at home? Yeah, you gotta have 10. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, just to think that I used to give type double space translations when I could have been having adorable videos all those years. That's yeah, right. right. <laughs> <laughs> so we can move on from audio and visual. I think that's the last audio and visual. Well, and I could just see some kids saying, I don't have any of these things, but I have like a thing of cherry tomatoes and I have. Yep, that's fine. <laughs> just anything I have 20 of, you know. Yeah. Their creativity is really remarkable and they they enjoy they seem to enjoy doing it. So my next category after artistic modes is reading, writing and studying. These are probably the more obvious types of assignments. Um, one of the things I started doing a few years ago is to have the students read the culture essay and make a graphic notes poster, what I call a fact map. Instead of just taking old fashioned notes or just reading, having them create an image. Um, and uh, I noticed that my students started scoring much better on the, um, you know, the test when they actually had created something on the content. So that was a successful homework assignment. This is when I used to let them build it out of whatever they wanted and they did a building and I used to walk and get food groups. And one time a group of kids um, came in all upset because the dog literally ate part of the project. <laughs> but they happened to have it on video because the father was trying out the new video camera so they could show me the perfect version, you know, and say, see, mm -hmm. it really was perfect at eight o'clock. <laughs> With gut, little gummy bear um, legionaries on the, on yes, the fortress wall. Yes. 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 Uh, back to the movies. You have two <laughs> questions. Yes. Um, have you already read the story in class? If not, how do you prevent the kids from just looking up a translation? That's mm -hmm. one question. And are these videos made after the story is read in class? So they're basically okay. the same thing. So um, this particular set was before we had read it in class. And how I pre prevent the students from looking up a translation? Um, <clears throat> years of training and building trust, <laughs> um, basically. Um, so, uh, however, that said, you could do this as type of assignment after you had read the story in class, or you could do it as a pre-reading assignment. This particular one was done as a pre-reading assignment, but I think you could do it either way. Um, if the kids are gonna cheat on it, they're still gonna do a lot of work. They're still gonna have to act out the story. Um, and they're still going to have to go in for their Latin blurbs and know where to insert them pr properly. So they'll still have gotten something out of it. And if they're just reading out a translation, you're going to know. Um, so I wouldn't grade it based on translation quality. Anyway, I didn't tell the kids they had to translate. I told them they had to tell the story in English. So um, that's another way that you can um skirt that is by telling them they have to do it in their own words they t do it in a modern voice so um so that, that i think those would be my guidelines for that um my students i mean like, like i said i we work really hard on our honor code at our school it doesn't mean we don't have kids that cheat but we do have a we do build relationships so that's kind of how i know my students aren't going to cheat on it or if they do cheat I know they'll know I know so kind of like that. And I always tell them their muscles going to get weaker and weaker because you wouldn't go to practice and let somebody else do your work for you and then expect to play yeah. well in the game match or whatever it is, you know, so yep. go ahead, be weak now, but it's going to ultimately if you don't want to learn Latin, you're yeah. not going to. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, this um, reading, writing and studying, I don't, I kind of like to think of if if you have to read something, you have to do something with it. Um, and on the right hand side, you see a Fabulae Latinae um, certificate. 
which is I assign them to read the story to someone. And they have to fill out the certificate with their name, the story, and then who they read it to. And then that person has to write them a little review. So it's just another way of getting them practicing Latin and great PR, by the way, because Uncle John Smith here got to hear that, you know, his niece got studied Latin. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. And then other, you know, things that I put in my playlist, definitely worksheets from the workbook or from the CLC fifth edition online materials. So a good workshop, a good worksheet well placed is a great homework assignment. Making and studying flashcards or Quizlet is a good homework assignment for me. Maybe that would work for other people who have to do more vocab work in class, but that's that's how I um, manage sort of vocab vocab drilling as homeworks. Um, exercises from the book. More and more I do exercises from the book in class when I want to grade them and they can do it at home for practice as well for homework, but I'm probably not going to grade that. And then another thing that I do for homework occasionally is homework choice time where I'll give them options. I'll give them, you can read a story, you can um, read a story using the Cambridge Online Clickable, you can do um, sorting games online, you could study vocabulary. Um, so giving them three or four options to choose from. I've been trained in the responsive classroom and um, through my work in the lower school. And so that's how I learned about choice time, how much it means to students when they get to choose their own homework assignments. So I think that that's, I, and in class activities too, I think that that's something I'll do more in the future. Very nice. I loved what Uncle John Smith said too. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Sometimes the, the, the comments that the parents or friends write are really funny to read. Mm-hmm. Donna, do, don't you do stuff with the kids read to their parents? Yes, I do. Uh -huh. Yeah. One of my favorite assignments. Oh, I left off one, one of, I guess, one opportunity. Um, every once in a while, giving a no homework is just fine. And boy, will they love you. So mm -hmm. <laughs> one homework could be a no homework. Yeah. Nice. So I put projects on this list because I do quite a lot of projects throughout the year. So maybe six to eight weeks out of the year, they're working on projects. And I know everybody does a lot of projects. And I think as as a community of non teachers, we know how to rock our projects. <laughs> Am I right, ladies? Yes, <laughs> but here are just a few that I do. And, um, you know, maybe they'll inspire somebody else. I had my eighth graders assigned a character from uh, Roman Britain, and they had to illustrate that person and choose Latin and English words to describe them. So these were great. Actually, I still have them up in my room right now. Um, it also is cool to have like the younger students get interested and see a project they'd like to do or see a character that intrigues them. So posters are so many options. Yeah, and the thing you did here so beautifully is um, you connected the dots. It's not just let's draw, you know, a Roman and put some words around them. These are people that are part of the storyline and the culture. So you're really pulling a lot of things together doing this. They had to have two objects that associate with a character and they had to have a certain number of words, both in English and Latin. So, yep. And then for on the other end of the higher students, the um, I had the 10th grade Latin three students oh, when sorry. they finished reading the Daedalus and Icarus um, section, creating uh, posters about the myths uh, from Crete. So uh, each student got a different phase of the myth. And these were great because I was able to use, I, ha I ended up with six different posters of different phases of that myth. And then I could use them to teach that myth to my fifth and sixth graders, which is just fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a great connection. And, uh, you know, I had them also write up the little note card is their description, their summary of that part of the myth. I think so. that I'm gonna take your poster and show it to your brother in his class. <laughs> 
you're exactly super and, successful exactly yeah. and the little kid the younger kids they want to know oh who made that one so i tell them i said that's you know grumio dixon and doesn't he have a uh you know don't you want to be like him when you get to high school and right. take that <laughs> Well, yeah. and I think it's cool because it looks, it's also introducing such beautiful art to them. I mean, you know, there's so many connections telling the story and giving a visual, but it's not just a picture, it's a pretty picture. Mm -hmm. And again, you get to have these up in your classroom. Yeah, I think it looks like a museum, like with a sign at the bottom of the art, you know. My students' work is like my prized possession. I believe. On the left hand, oh yeah. So bulletin boards on the left hand side, my this is from my colleague, my co-teacher, Allison, um, and she did with her, <clears throat> excuse me, her Latin four class uh, project on Mount Vesuvius, and each kid had to do a part of it for homework, and then they assembled it into one display, and then my Latin um, two class created a, a handout to, to be completed with the the board and then my younger kids completed that handout so it was like a real full circle um uh, experience with this bulletin board project which started as homework assignments and then i didn't have a really good picture of my noun adjective declension mobiles i don't know if anybody else does this project um maybe ladies know where at the end of unit two i have them basically decline a noun adjective pair in the singular and plural as a mobile so each of the cases gets its own dangly card and then they have to um because they know all the cases by the end of the blue book and they've got noun adjective agreement and they de decorate them with an egyptian theme so sorry i'm sorry that these picture doesn't really show that very well but you can see them dangling down in the classroom and so they're really cool to display that way so like over here, uh, my mouse is no longer working, but over here where there's like two hanging near each other, is yeah. one the noun and the other the adjective? One is the singular and one is the plural. Oh, okay. So each the card, the card will have like the noun adjective in the okay. nominative singular, and then the, the one opposite of that has the noun and adjective in the plural. I was going in a different direction. Yeah. Okay. Well, I've lost control of my mouse, so I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Um, these little Roman soldiers are another really popular project. They are, um, each kid gets a different rank. And this project, I would have to credit, I know a lot of people do this, but I, I, I got the idea from my colleague, Sarah Morris, now retired, so, um, and kept it going once she left the school. So these little uh, Roman soldiers are always fun to display. And when other people come and see these, this great advertisement, they love them so your administration your department chair parents visiting these are a big selling sort of selling point for the language we did this as a competition and some mm -hmm. two or three people had to come in from whatever other teachers an administrator a parent and judge them oh that's fun and so it was you know it was a wonderful um crossover mm -hmm. thing with the community so i i also won someday i want to do full-size ones yeah display them down a hallway and i think that would be really fun too so now are those templates or do they just make up their own drawings or they just make up their own drawing i tell them it has to be like between two and a half feet and three feet or something like that i can't remember the exact specs by the way if anybody wants details on any of these yeah. projects or assignments you get in touch with me and i'll give you what i have for rubrics and instructions um, but they do come up with their own outline. So that those are two feet tall. Yeah. Wow. Uh, with the ones that have spears and stuff are become okay. taller. Yeah. Right. 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 Yep. They're cool. Uh, the Fixio project. I know a lot of people do these. Yeah. Um, I have a write up that is a step by step write up that's really good for our middle schoolers. If anybody wants it. Um, so this will be done over about a week homework, so including the weekend. So usually, I guess five to homework nights. And then this was a new one for me that I got from all my time on Pinterest, which mm -hmm. was to make an interactive fol folder projects. So you take a folder and the students were told they were given a topic and they had to teach the topic 
make a practice and then make a game like an assessment game. And I took the topics from the national Latin exam, like all the topics that aren't in Cambridge and that I never get to like Caratius Cocles and such. And I made them do their projects on that. So kids really enjoyed making these. Tons of help on Pinterest if you need inspiration. Absolutely. I just think they look cool. I want they, they really came out really well. And uh, what I did was I kept them. And then when we we're getting ready for the national Latin exam this year, they come out and everybody gets to play with them. Nice. nice. Yep. And it's so compact. I mean, I love the idea. It's all in a folder. Yes. And now they're just in, like in a little box in my cupboard and they're all filed there. So. I think this is something that could really be expanded on as I know there's interactive notebooks, but even throughout the course, there's places where you could really do something like this and make it help them consolidate a bunch of information by creating a game. It would be fun to do an inter like interactive folder project for a stage, yeah. for a character, or for a place. Yeah, um, any of those. <laughs> so, and I found that my students really got into it once I showed them. I, I made a Pinterest collection of all the different ideas of how to make the cool envelopes and little grommets and things. And so once they knew that they got a trip to the craft store, they were they got into it, most of them. <laughs> uh, word art is something simple and that can be so meaningful and so powerful. So whether it's a fifth grader here on the left with Lita or an upper schooler with Victoria and believe it or not, Fortis was created by a sixth grader. Wow, it's really good. Really cool. But you don't have to be a great artist to show the meaning like Lita demonstrates. And those will help kids learn words in a heartbeat. They'll never forget. We actually did an installation for our World Language Week posters for all the different languages and it's been extremely powerful. Yeah. So a few final thoughts, keeping your player list fresh, like that's big for me. I always want to try new things, get ideas, surf on Pinterest a bit and try something new. And I love the ability to display student artwork, invite people in to see it. If your kids make something cool, like shamelessly email your administrator and department chair and tell them to come and see it. <laughs> my middle school head, every time my students make something cool, I email him, come by when my students are in class. And he comes and he sees it and he can tell them how cool what they made it is. It's really good, really meaningful to them. Um, same shameless self promotion, get good at it. We have Latin to save. Um, and then adapt what you're doing to the students you have. You might have a group that hates drawing. Don't assign them drawing. Assign them, you know, something with Minecraft instead. Have them do Minecraft characters from a Cambridge story. Um, or just have them read. Whatever they, you know, you got to tap into what your students are good at and what they like. And most of all, have fun. That's my number one. I guess takeaway from teaching is if you're not having fun, they're not having fun. If they're not having fun, you're not having fun. So we all have to figure out what is fun for us to learn. And having fun doesn't mean just um, um, playing games. It doesn't mean that. No. No. Meaningful fun is you know learning. Right. Power of learning through having fun is actually scientifically proven. So. Very nice. Thank you, Stephanie. Really great, great ideas. I My know. pleasure. Yeah. yeah thank it was you fabulous. So much. I hope to hear from other people with their ideas. So my email is there. Please send me your ideas. Um, I'm grateful to the Cambridge listserv on Facebook and the ideas that I see from my colleagues there. And I'm, you know, I hope that you will ask me for any materials that you would like to see more of from this presentation.